Hi everyone, thanks for watching, I'm Dimitri and today we are going to talk about BPF performance. Usually you could uh, see me talking and doing something about Postgres, but at the beginning of the year I took a very interesting challenge of trying to understand what actually happens from the performance perspective inside BPF programs. It turns out to be quite interesting and tricky challenge, uh, and here's the reason why. So normally when we're talking about performance, everything is more or less clear from the visibility point of view. So we have our user space application, we have some kernel part that it relies on, and we know how to like profile both parts, we know how to get metrics, uh, required metrics and relevant metrics, and so on. Now, if we will extend this situation with some dynamic BPF, things are getting a little bit more tricky. It's not that actually that clear how to get visibility into those parts. Uh, for example, here we're talking about uh, such uh, projects as, for example, Red Hat Advanced Cluster Security or its open source counterpart StackRocks. And you may ask, uh, why bother actually? Why do we need to understand uh, performance implications of BPF programs since they are pretty small and they have to be executed pretty fast? Yeah, that's true. But here and in this talk in general, we're going to talk about those use cases that are actually sort of dictated to those uh, by those projects that I mentioned before, StackRocks, where those BPF programs are actually lying on the hot path, unfortunately, which means that even smallest overhead can actually accumulate over the time. And it makes sense to actually understand those all the uh, performance applications. So having this in mind, let's try to understand how to get uh, visibility into BPF programs. On the course of the following slides, we're actually going to talk about various methods in order of their increasing complexity and increasing uh, precision. So the first one is, uh, well, essentially we could collect global statistics. Fortunately for us, kernel can collect these statistics without actually us doing anything. So, but that's actually easier to show. So let me do this. Uh, what we have here is a virtual machine where we have some uh, BPF program running. It's actually a part of this uh, libbpf bootstrap, uh, so nothing particularly exciting, just as an example. So, uh, normally, BPF tool, we could see that something is happening. So we have three BPF programs uh, attached to some particular points, and they're actually tracing and executing of various processes in the system. Now, the thing is that you could see there are these extensions for the normal information that BPF tool shows us. Now we have here a runtime and run count. Why is that happening? It's because we have enabled, we have enabled this, uh, statistics collection, uh, in the kernel itself. So we did, we did this thingy. Uh, it's global information, it's sort of an uptime type of things, but it still can get you some interesting ballpark numbers to do some sanity checks for like more advanced methods. So it's a very interesting thing to talk about. And while we're actually here, I wanted to show one interesting sort of a hack and very, at the same time, very funny way of collecting similar type of information via perf. So normally, uh, all those BPF programs, they actually has to be shown in the call theme. So let's check. Uh, so we see there are a lot of symbols and less three of them are actually our BPF programs loaded in the memory and we, the best part here is actually that we could get the exact address at which those programs are located. Which means that we would actually do a very funny thing, we could actually trace the memory events where something happened to, something hit this particular address. So let's try to do this, perf, trace, we have the first address for this first program and now let's do something. Let's execute a list. And now we see we've got hit, uh, we've got timestamp, we've got process name, process ID and so on. Very interesting type of thing is, uh, it's not really very detailed in the sense it gives you just a little bit more information than the global statistics, but I still find it very interesting. Yep. So now let's continue. Uh, another very simple thing you could do is you can actually extend your BPF programs just to print some information. So do print a K with timestamps or something, and then you could read it from the trace pipeline, which is again, extremely straightforward, very flexible, but introduces a lot of overhead, unfortunately, because of user space to kernel space communication. So it's not really feasible to do this with a quite loaded use cases, unfortunately. So let's continue. 
Uh, and now what we actually use it, uh, usually do in when we want to understand, for example, uh, what happens from within one particular component or function in our system. We usually create uh, tracing points at the beginning of this function and at the end of this function. And then, for example, we counter some events in between. So sort of a perf stat type of thing is. And we could actually try to do the same for BPF programs. And on this slide, you, could, uh, you see uh, an example of, like, just a simple example of BPF trace script, where, where we try to do something similar for a BPF program that attaches itself to an every syscall at the beginning and at the end. So we instrument here uh, one function, one level above, do syscall64. Uh, which is probably already a little bit more uh, performant and more efficient than the previous solution, but still it's not a perfect one because here we're actually not measuring what we want. We're measuring not the exact PPF program itself, but we measure something extra. So we're measuring something extra before and something extra after. So it's not very uh, uh, perfect approach. The perfect way, like the best in class, would be actually to use the exact same uh, attachment point that we need. And for that, we can actually create uh, and use F entry, F exit BPF programs. So again, it's better to show uh, than talk about. So uh, let's return to our situation here. We have a BPF program. And fortunately for us, this F entry, F exit type of thing is actually implemented in many tools, including BPF tool, for example. So uh, BPF tool, rook, profile. So one of those things is actually profile uh, command in BPF tool. This creates, this uses exactly the same approach I, have just, I just mentioned. So we try to profile our program with an ID 5 and we count events, uh, just the hardware event cycles. So now let's see what happens actually under the hood. So now if we will take a look which programs we have, we have something uh, extra suddenly. So we have our three BPF programs that we were uh, observing before, and now we have this F entry, F exit program created by BPF tool exactly for this purpose. And it's also very interesting to take a look at this. Uh, if uh, How does it work under the hood? So let's see, dump, do I have it? Yeah, dumps and here is it. So normally, when uh, BPF programs are getting jitted, they have some amount, like some prolog at the beginning, and usually the first instructions in this is actually no operations. Here you can see that this no operations is actually replaced by some call. Why is that? This no operation in prolog is actually working in exactly, it's been placed there exactly for this purpose to implement a fan tree f exit thing is because then if we attach something, we can actually replace these instructions with something else with a call to whatever we have registered for f entry. And that's how it works with a very little overhead, which is very, which I find very interesting. So here is it, and here is on the slide you can see an example where on the left hand side you can see actually there is a no operation instruction that was replaced by some call. So now it's of course very interesting to collect some uh, counters in between two uh, probes, but sometimes it makes perfect sense to actually try to understand what happens in between, what happens between those two tracing points. So normally when we would like to do this, we just profile our applications. Could we do something similar with BPF programs? The answer is yes, fortunately yes, but with some caveats that we're going to discuss. Uh, so again, it's probably better to show, and I believe I already have this. Let's see, proof and annotate. Don't I have it here probably? Yeah, proof and annotate. Yeah. So what we could do, actually, we could collect. Indeed, we could sample our uh, BPF programs, then we could, for example, annotate them. Unfortunately, since here we have BTF information uh, coupled together with the program, we can even correspond it to the code we have written. And here in this particular example, we actually collect uh, stalled uh, micro operations, which is essentially the situation when not a single micro operation was delivered in this particular cycle. Uh, here we, there's, it's not that many samples here, but we could see that a lot of them are actually concentrated around a ring buffer, a reserve helper, which means that we probably would like to look closer at what happens there. Uh, this type of information is very, very useful. For example, if you'd like to understand why your BPF program is like, for example, fronted bounded or back and bounded. So what, where are the memory stalls? Or for example, I don't know, uh, the TLB stalls or something like that. 
uh, but there is a little bit annoyance here because unfortunately it's not possible to profile those programs in isolation. So, you know, uh, in a way BPF programs are extended in the kernel, which means that you, to be able to do this, you have to actually pro profile the record profile over the whole kernel. Maybe you would like to like limit it somehow. Uh, collect on like kernel stacks and so on and so forth, but at the end of the day you have to like essentially profile everything and then just filter out all those bits that you need, which means that unfortunately you could collect a lot a lot of samples that are actually not very relevant for you, but that's probably the easiest way, like the path of least resistance how to do this. Yep, uh, so now having this information in mind, we already understand more or less how to understand what's going on from the inside of BPF programs. How could we use this information to improve situation? Uh, disclaimer, uh, obviously normally the best way to improve your performance is to improve an algorithmical part of things. So here we're talking about the situations where the implementation is already decent enough and you just would like to like, you know, squeeze out a little bit further some, uh, some, some timings. So one very interesting and somehow not a common knowledge uh, thing is instruction sets. So the thing is that kernel supports various BPF instruction sets. And they are essentially like getting more and more instructions in between of various versions. It just happened that it was developing naturally and there were certain limitations and like needing to support previous versions and so on and so forth. There were some uh, limitations imposed on v1 and then a little bit more instruction happened to be in v2 and even more instructions in v3 and so on and so forth. What does it mean for us? It means that uh, normally, unfortunately, when we uh, generate, we have compli compile our BPF programs, they are being compiled by default with a generic instruction set, which is a v1 one, because it just supported everywhere. But if you know that you can support v2, for example, because you have to work with, you can work with the newer kernel versions, uh, you could actually compile your program in a little bit more extended instruction set and then, uh, and then uh, at the end of the day it will be more concise. So what I'm talking about here is, for example, on the slide you could see an example. We have a code where we just essentially have one simple stupid condition. We compare some value uh, which is less than another value. Nothing really extremely important, but the thing is that here we use this less than uh, operation condition. And unfortunately, there is no exactly this instruction in the v1. There is no less than something. So that means that when we compile this program with PPF version 1 instruction set, we have to do a workaround. And you see that in the final jitted version, we have actually an instruction jump after which is essentially a part of this workaround. And as soon as we switch to version 2, we see that we could compile it in a little bit more concise code without this overhead, without this workaround, uh, where we could use jump before, which is pretty nice. And at the end of the day, it's very important for the code layout. And in general, it will impact your, for example, your front and bounded, uh, front and bound stalls, for example, for your applications. Uh, and essentially, it will make your BPF program smaller, which is, of course, nice. Another important topic is BPF to BPF calls. Uh, so the thing is that in the older kernels and compilers, every time when we would like, for example, to create a utility function, like, you know, something that's been used across various BPF programs, we always had to inline it, unfortunately, because otherwise it's just not going to work. And I actually see it every now and then still, uh, even in some modern uh, projects uh, for using BPF under the hood. Uh, the thing is that nowadays you actually don't have to do this. Nowadays you can actually create those utility functions and they're going to be converted to those BPF2 BPF calls where you, for example, if you're going to dump the final jitted code, you could see that actually it's going to contain two sections where one is going to call another one. Uh, at the end of the day, it boils down to pretty much the same situation as with a normal application when you decide where, whether to inline some function or not. You may inline something to avoid jump overhead, but at the same time, you're going to make your function body bigger. Maybe it will make your uh, function more front and bounded and so on and so forth. The very same situation with BPF. So you may want to inline something, but you will make your BPF program bigger. Maybe it will introduce more, for example, instruction cache measures or something like that. Or uh, maybe it will be actually beneficial because you're going to avoid this jump. You just have to decide for yourself. The, the best part is just now at least we have this possibility to figure out what is the best solution for this particular case and use it. <clears throat> So the following slides are actually called how to improve in the future, mostly because most of the features I'm talking about, they have landed not, not pretty, pretty recently, but they're still pretty exciting. They're showing a very interesting development that happens nowadays. And the first one is actually map batch operations. 
So it's actually developed for those use cases where you have to work a lot with BPF maps. If you have to like produce a lot of uh, new values or do a lot of lookups and so on and so forth. And uh, for example, for, for example, when you're doing those lookups from user space, you introduce a lot of uh, user space to kernel space uh, communication. Just when you're doing this, like you know, one element, one by one element which is not that efficient and ju it just makes sense to actually batch those operations together to cut this overhead, which is pretty nice. So keep this in mind when you have a similar situation like described here. Another very exciting thing uh, I have found is actually a program pack allocator and it again uh, takes this idea of uh, improving BPF layout a little bit further. So the thing is that uh, before, the BPF program are still, but they are extremely small. Quite often they could be relatively big, but normally they are small. And in the past they had to actually reside on one page in memory, which means there is going to be like one program, one page in memory, which is a little bit waste. And at the same time, if you have a lot, a lot of BPF programs, you also introduce a lot of, for example, instruction TLB pressure because those pages, they have to be resolved, address have to be found and so on and so forth, which is not very uh, which is just unfortunate. So that's why nowadays kernel tries to pack those programs together uh, on a single page. And sometimes it happens to be that it packs them even on a huge page, which is very interesting. Uh, and actually it happens, all happens transparently for you. So you don't have to think about this, except that you probably may think about whether or not you use uh, uh, huge, ma uh, huge, huge pages on your system. Another very interesting thing that could actually help you a lot, for example, with algorithmical part of things is Bloom filter map, which is absolutely mind blowing. Uh, and it was, I think, implemented quite recently. And if you don't know what is it, uh, Bloom filter is actually um, a probabilistic data structure that allows you quite fast and super efficiently figure out if an element is not present in the map. It's uh, probabilistic in a sense that you can figure out with 100 uh, precision, percent, percent precision that element is not present in the map. If it's present, you may sometimes get false positives, so you have to verify it. But for the first, for the former case, it's pretty, pretty efficient. So if you have this particular type of situation in your program, you may want to use Bloom filter instead of anything else. And the last but not the least one is a very interesting development. It's a thing called task local storage. Uh, do not confuse it with a thread local storage. Uh, this one, and I think the similar thing happens for uh, C group local storage and for even socket local storage. It's essentially an area in memory that is a local to the thread or to the task you're working with. So what is it for? The thing is that quite often, for example, for tracing or for security reasons, we're working with the various tasks and we would like to uh, keep some information, some bookkeeping ba based on these tasks. So what happens usually we create like a BPF hash map, uh, where we store some values, where the key by the key, which is actually a process ID, for example, or the threat ID or something like that. Normal, generally speaking, it's okay, but every time when you, for example, execute our BPF program, you have to do this lookup or, for example, update this information and so on, which actually takes a little bit of an overhead. And now you can actually store the very same information in the thread locally to the thread, which means that an access to it is going to be blazing fast. Uh, it's essentially just a matter of, uh, sort of a back, uh, sort of a backend, uh, bound operations where you're probably going to have a, a memory stalls on one side. And at the same time, since it's already local to the thread, you already have it there. So it's going to be much, much faster. So that's it, folks. Uh, I hope I managed to make you a little bit more confident, uh, what concerns reasoning about performance, what happens from within, uh, BPF programs. And uh, I would be glad to answer any question you have.